I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two speakers for today. We have Kirsten Trudeau. Kirsten is a nurse practitioner here at KYIP with experience in pediatrics, vascular access, and home care. She develops education for us, and she also leads the development of simulation um, activities for KYIP. And our second presenter is Dr. Julia Frith. Julia leads the KYIP team, and she's had has over 20 years of nursing experience with the last 15 years being in infection prevention. And she has experience working with patients across the care continuum. And Kirsten, if you're ready, I'll have you go ahead and begin presenting. All right. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so we'll just jump right on in. So here in the United States, um, we are all very fortunate to have exceptional water treatment, um, but that does not exclude us from the risks that are associated with water and healthcare. Um, so we have a lot to cover with this presentation, so we'll go on and dive in. Funding for this presentation was provided by the Kentucky Department for Public Health. Content includes discussion of unlabeled use of products. Um, the presenters have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of products. No commercial uh, support or, uh, was provided for this educational activity. And by the end of this uh, series, we hope that you have um, increased knowledge and competence in your ability to recognize the impact of waterborne infections in healthcare describe uh, environmental water treatment, monitoring and regulations, list sources and purposes of water usage in healthcare settings, identify risks associated with water in healthcare facilities, including waterborne infections, and be able to analyze opportunistic waterborne pathogens and related cases of outbreaks. So as I already mentioned, the U.S. has, a, has pretty robust methods for filtering and disinfecting water. Um, however, it really wasn't that long ago, just in the early 1900s, when drinking water caused, uh, caused illnesses like cholera, uh, which is caused by Vibrio cholera, and typhoid, which is caused by Salmonella, ta salmonella typhi. Um, and these were mostly GI illnesses, but um, were many times fatal. Um, and in fact, cholera and typhoid were historically top disease killers here in the U.S. Um, and they actually are still responsible for the most global deaths, despite being rare here in the U.S. Um, so, for example, there was a catastrophic earthquake um, in Haiti in 2010, um, and it devastated the water and sanitation infrastructure there, um, which has led to debil debilitating effects from cholera. Um, so back here in the U.S. in 1902, water treatment actually began um, and risks of those diseases significantly decreased. Um, Jersey City, New Jersey was the first to start disinfecting water, um, but we still have work to do. About one in 44 people will fall ill annually due to waterborne pathogens, according to the CDC, and that's about 7.2 uh, million Americans. Um, this has a $3 billion impact on the healthcare system. And today, the most well-known pathogen implicated in waterborne infections is actually Legionella. And Legionnaire's disease actually got its name in 1976 when an outbreak occurred at a convention in the, um, of the American Legion in Philadelphia. Um, and Legionnaire's disease has actu actually been on the rise since the year 2000 um, and is also suspected to be underdiagnosed many times. Um, and the rates may actually be 1.8 to about 2.7 um, times higher than what they are reported. So water is everywhere. And as we know, it's a basic necessity to live. And this goes for pathogens as well. So water travels to the source of where it's needed, but it leaves behind wet environments in that trail. Um, so what do pathogens love? They love a reservoir that they can thrive in. And um, water um, creates wet environments that can be just that. So these wet environments equal risk, and they are associated with microbial growth due to those biofilms or stagnation. Um, they can lead to antibiotic resistance and can even increase the risk of those hospital-acquired infections or HAIs. Um, and that's why we're here today to look at those risks um, and see how we can mitigate them with water management plans. Uh, so where do those pathogens live? So we, they can live in plumbing, sinks, drains, toilets, um, this is a nice example of a pipe showing how Legionella can live in pipes um, and grow in that biofilm. Um, so you can kind of see that uh, biofilm, biofilm associated bacteria um, in the, this is like a cross-sectional picture of a pipe 
Um, and you can see how that kind of sets, settles down into the bottom and creates that secreted slime. Um, it makes that biofilm and that's a, um, an excellent reservoir for where um, Legionella can live. So now let's talk about water before it makes it to those pipes. Um, so tap water meets uh, strict guidelines. And this water is, um, the water that is used in our homes um, does contain a certain level of bacteria that are gene deemed generally acceptable for populations outside of healthcare um, to use and consume. So there's minimal risk of those microbes causing, your, causing illness at home. Um, and as you can see here, the water is treated and goes through meticulous filtration um, it goes through coagulation, sedimentation, filtration, and disinfection. So you can see that the water really does go through quite the filtration process. Um, but what does that mean for healthcare? If there's still an acceptable threshold of bacteria in tap water, what does that mean for vulnerable, vulnerable patients? Um, and are there uh, plumbing considerations? What are the microbial risks associated with sinks and drains? Um, we're going to look at all of that today. So as part of that process of treating water, um, you might have noticed there was a, um, a, um, a portion of that treatment um, that was disinfection. And so once the disinfection occurs, there's a, you're left with a disinfection residual. Um, and this is part of public water systems distribution systems, and it's used to control microbial contamination. And um, so it has it provides protection against microbes in the water system. There are alerts for errors within that distribution system, and it does limit the growth of bacteria. And this really came out of a, um, a rule called the Surface Water Treatment Rule um, from the um, EPA in 1999. Um, and looked at the efficacy of the different types of disinfectants, um, such as chlorine, chloramines, and chlorine, or chlorine dioxide. Um, and then just further to look at some of those, um, uh, the acceptability of water quality, we can briefly go over some of the regulations from the United States Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. Um, and these establish requirements for the water treated around us. Um, so there is a revised total coliform rule. It establishes a maximum containment level or an MCO for E. coli in drinking water. And of course, just as we spoke about the surface water treatment rule, um, this is a requirement for disinfection of surface um, and drinking water systems. And it provides a 99.9% .9 removal of viruses, Giardia, Cryptosporidium. Uh, and then we have the groundwater rule which requires the identification of susceptibility to fecal contaminants. Um, and if those, um, if there is a susceptibility to those contaminants, this rule does require that action be taken to prevent that. Um, so you might be thinking, who keeps track of all of this? Who monitors, who reports it? Um, so the local water companies test and report the results of water contaminants each year. Um, and typically these reports show a compliance level, reported levels, re a range for contamination detected, um, the MCL and a likely source for these substances. Um, and so you'll see here that this is an example from Warren County here in Kentucky um, in 2002. Um, and by law, these reports must be made public. Um, so these examples um, that I'm gonna show you here and on the next couple of slides are really just to show you how to read the report. And that these reports are generally um, showing the same, um, you know, similar if not the same information, regardless of you know, where the report was or who produced it. Um, it's generally speaking on the same information. Um, so you can see here that we've got the uh, compliance um, highlighted, the report level, the range, the MCL, and the likely source, and of course the substance that they're reporting on. Um, and then this is another example of water quality um, from Lexington, Kentucky in 2022. Um, so you can see, again, they're reporting, on, they're reporting on similar things, the substance, the compliance, the MCL, the range, the typical source. Um, so the reports might look a little bit different visually, but the information is the same and you'll read them the same way. Um, and then lastly, this is just one more example. This is from Louisville Water Company um, from 2022 test results. Again, you've got the same type of things being reported on. Um, it's just a different way that they, um, you know, the report visually looks. 
Um, so now what happens when water comes into the healthcare facility? So water usage in healthcare facilities um, includes direct contact, ingestion, indirect contact, and inhalation. And so this brings us kind of back to the beginning of the presentation where we established that water really is used everywhere. Um, and there's water everywhere in a healthcare facility. Um, and looking into it a little bit deeper into water usage in healthcare, um, you can see there's many ways that water might meet patients and potentially transmit pathogens. Um, so there could be repo um, a, you know, a transmission of pathogens through reprocessing medical devices or drinking waters um, in neonatal ICUs in those um, neonatal incubators with respiratory care, oral care, medication and infection prevention near sinks, or sorry, infection preparation, um, near sinks, any uh, droplets and aerosols from showers and toilets, um, any type of preparation um, of breast milk or formula, and then anywhere where food might be uh, prepped. And now uh, Julia is going to share with us a literature review on water and HIIs. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, so this particular um, literature review was done by Kenormi uh, Weber and Rutella, and the review was really focused on healthcare associated outbreaks and infections um, caused by waterborne pathogens, and they found multiple outbreaks um, in this with this scenario. Um, and these outbreaks were associated with a number of pathogens, included infections um, such as bacteremias, pneumonias, as well as disseminated disease. Um, interestingly, the populations included um, transplant patients or intensive care patients, but it also included patients like surgical patients or many other um, compromised patients within the healthcare setting. Um, the causative bacteria included things such as serratia, Legionella, um, NTM, or Pseudomonas, which is something that um, obviously creates biofilms and is very difficult to eradicate. Um, we all know that potable water is not sterile, right? And Kirsten talked about the requirements for water that comes into our health system and that we know that there are some level of bacteria that are that are in our potable water. Um, but we can also recognize that this can pose some type of risk to a potential patient population. And so on this next slide here, it shows some of the outbreaks included in the review and includes transmission, organisms, reservoirs, and the type of infection that was identified. Um, this review has multiple, um, this table is multiple pages long. There are a number of outbreaks that are associated uh, with water in the healthcare setting. Um, and, and I think that this is um, a very nice review and it show, tells um, the individual what was the reservoir that they found? What were the particular pathogens? How do they think that the transmission occurred in that setting? Um, and what was the, the from the outbreak perspective, was it a strong causation? What was, what was the study type that was done? Interestingly enough, this runs back from 1997 all, all the way to 2015. And arguably, I suspect that this is not something um, that has completely gone away. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, you know, this shows some sources that, that really were highlighted um, within this review that are things that we really probably need to consider within the healthcare setting. Um, when we're looking at what are those activities or those locations that could be high risk. So as it relates to bathing, um, processes um, and, and procedures and practices that we have in place around tubs, drains, showers, shower wands, um, and bathing mattresses, um, particularly around sinks, um, where's the faucets location to the drain, electric faucets, um, uh, aerators, um, those water saving devices, so decreasing the flow in the, in the area, um, outlets and drains within our sinks, heater cooler units, so those de medical devices that actually use water as a key component to their functionality, um, understanding your hospital hospital water systems, and then ice machines. So some of those, um, uh, these sources were highlighted within this literature review to have been associated in some capacity with um, outbreaks for, um, and, and, and with, with water uh, being implicated. Kirsten. Thank you, Julia. 
Um, <clears throat> so just as Julia um, discussed, there are definitely risks to consider. So you can see um, some of the risks, considerations for healthcare facilities here um, would include an overnight stay in facilities. Um, if you have patients with acute or chronic conditions, um, immunocompromised patients, patients older than 65, um, if you have a facility that's a multi-complex unit with central water heaters, um, a, a facility that is greater than 10 stories, if you use cooling towers, if, they, if there's a hot tub or spa, any decorative fountains, um, the use of central atomizers, misters, air washers, or humidifiers. Um, I suspect that, that many of you on this um, call probably answered yes to more than one of these. Um, and if you answered yes to any of these, you uh, must have a water management plan in place. Um, and so you can break these risks down internally and externally. So some of those external risks um, within uh, water and healthcare, um, not having a disinfectant residual. Um, if there's a water main break, events that cause low pressure within the system, flushing fire hydrants, um, advisories that are issued to boil water, changes to the municipal water, um, and then construction. And then internally, um, some of those hazards um, would be anywhere where the where biofilm can form. Um, so storage tanks, areas of stagnation, handheld showers, flow restrictors, areas um, where commodes or toilets can't be covered or separated by a door. Um, so you can have um, also with risk any any place where like scale or sediment can form. Um, if the, there's variations in water temperature, if the pH of the water is off, um, any insufficient levels of disinfectant. And so when you're when you're talking about the tap water that has been disinfected, when the water comes into your building, it has a certain level of disinfectant in it. We talked about this disinfectant residual, but then once it's within the um, in your facility, that disinfectant level can go down um, and that can make um, their risk for, you know, those waterborne pathogens, um, depending on how long that water um, is in the facility. Um, and so contamination in your water can happen in three different places or ways. Um, and you can look at these from an upstream, midstream or downstream um, um, to, you know, types of situations. So upstream is going to be before it gets to you. Um, so you can see from this picture, you know, if you have a water main break, so your water main break can be externally, um, like the one on the street that you see, or it can be within the facility, um, like a pipe burst within the facility. Um, any decreases in pressures, um, if, the, if you have a really uh, high story building, um, this is, you know, concerning if the pressure decreases, and it's particularly concerning if that pressure remains low for a long period of time, um, because when the pressure is not pushing that water through, it can lead to areas of stagnation and um, actually promote that biofilm, biofilm growth. And then you have midstream effects. Um, so this really is, you know, looking at your facility's plumbing. So um, the age, the designs, any additions or modifications, um, the water's age, uh, dead ends. Oftentimes, um, if there's any type of construction or renovation, um, if a sink is really deemed that it's not needed where it is, um, they will remove the sink and then cap that off. We've heard of this many times where that that capped area then becomes a prime area for pathogen growth um, because it's a, it's a dead end. Where, where, was, where is that water going to go if it's not coming out of the sink there? Um, and then downstream leads to potential exposure to the patients. Um, so this is particularly concerning when it gets to this point um, because then you have um, concern for those immunocompromised patients, patients having um, invasive procedures like um, surgery or if they have a medical device in use. Um, so downstream is when it actually gets to the point of, of reaching the patient. Um, and now Julia will share another literature review on HAIs in water containing equipment. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. So like Kirsten um, discussed, um, there's upstream, midstream, and downstream impacts as it relates to our water. Um, and this re review really points out areas of potential exposure through common medical equipment um, that is used. So this is a review of the literature that was done. Um, the authors were working to understand um, uh, what the impact was of these water containing pieces of equipment on hospital associated infections. 
And so they developed a list of medical devices that were utilized within their facility. Um, and this list included devices such as heater cooler devices used for bypass surgery to devices such as nebulizers. So very high complex pieces of medical equipment to a piece of medical equipment that I suspect most people use within their healthcare um, location. Um, and then from this list, they performed a review to see if any outbreaks of healthcare associated infections had been linked back to these devices. Um, and they determined that the water reservoir and water containing devices can be a source of microbial growth and transmission to patients despite the semi-closed um, water circuit and proper handling and cleaning and disinfection can help to reduce this burden um, and consequently um, transmission to infections, um, transmission to patients. And so on this slide here, you can see an overview of all of the water containing devices that they recognized um, within the um, hospitals. Um, and so they've got um, the list of the equipment. They've got the number of articles that were associated with outbreaks um, related to these particular pieces of medical device, um, as well as what the risk was that was identified and what some of the prevention strategies were in the patient populations that were potentially at risk. I think we have all um, are familiar or most of us on this call are familiar with the very large global outbreak related to heat or cooler units. However, there are other outbreaks um, on this list that I think are, are, are really important. Um, neonatal incubators, for example, nebulizers um, um, being implicated and, and, and the like. And so Kirsten, on the next slide, um, I just have, um, you know, really a list here of devices to consider. Um, again, heater cooler devices, hemodialysis equipment. How is that maintained? How is that stored? How is that cleaned? Our neonatal incubators, um, many times they use humidified um, air. And so um, obviously making sure that, that that process for cleaning and disinfecting those particular devices is imperative. Our dental units, um, many obviously use uh, water um, in that capacity fluid warmers, nebulizers, and water traps. Interestingly, um, water baths was brought up, and this is for um, kind of thawing of, of items that we're going to administer to patients. So uh, maybe cryo or some other item that was previously frozen and gets um, uh, thawed out to then be used. And so really understanding what is the process around these particular pieces of equipment as they've all been implicated in outbreaks um, of hospital associated infections um, secondarily to, to, to the water utilized in them. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so when, it, when the contaminated water meets the patient, um, as Julia discussed, there can be significant um, you know, implications to this. So water-borne uh, pathogens can cause many ailments, uh, respiratory, neurological illnesses, uh, skin problems, GI illnesses, bloodstream infections. Um, and then we also have to consider the transmission of contaminated drinking water and breathing water droplets. Um, and then of course, getting water in the ears um, and nose. Um, so then if we look at some of the opportunistic pathogens um, related to uh, waterborne infections, um, we can look at these kind of broken down by the types of pathogens. So these are some of the most common gram negative bacteria. So not to say that there aren't more gram negative bacteria that cause um, waterborne infections, um, but these are some of the more common ones. Um, and you'll notice the ones here in bold like Pseudomonas, Burgoldaria, um, Schinotopomonas, Acinetobacter, and Legionella. These are going to be on your regular water testing panels. Um, and then you'll have um, Ralstonia and Elizabethkenia that can also be done, um, you know, in addition, if that is something that's of concern. Um, and then Julia is going to share a review with us on Pseudomonas. So in, in this um, review, so Pseudomonas um, is an opportunistic pathogen, which um, is widely occurring in the environment and is recognized for its capacity to, to form um, or join biofilms, which is obviously um, a, a real a real challenge from an eradication perspective. Um, and it's interesting um, how adaptable Pseudomonas really is and its capacity to integrate the biofilm um, 
from faucets and drains and its impact that it has on premise plumbing in large buildings. And so this review um, really created some um, really nice proactive control measures um, for uh, water contamination uh, that can be caused by Pseudomonas. And so the, really the, the authors felt like a better understanding of the ecology of Pseudomonas were key factors in influencing premise plumbing um, to identify the, the culprit of that. And if we go to the next slide. So this is a summary of the suggested guidelines um, and control measures that the, that the authors of this particular review um, felt like was very important as it relates to really um, decreasing the risk of, of pseudomonas biofilm, particularly in your, in your facility. So as it relates to the faucet design, really making sure that the surface area in contact with water, um, understanding the stagnant mixed hot and cold water volume, um, the presence of plastic and other um, elastomatic materials. Um, and it's not as simple as choosing the best mode of activation for your faucet electric versus manual, um, but you really have to understand the design of your and characteristics of the tap of the, of the building and other things. Um, thermo, uh, thermostatic mixing valves, um, really a risk assessment needs to be done before those are installed um, just to make sure that vulnerable populations aren't at risk for scalding. So we want to make sure that our water, um, our hot water is able to stay hot, um, but you also don't want to run the risk of um, individuals getting burned. Um, and so a risk assessment needs to be done be before those types of mixing valves are really done. Um, they talked about flow straighteners and aerators. Um, they should be you know, avoided as much as possible. Um, they developed some um, recommendations around sampling. Um, and really that's something that, you know, like, we'll talk about tomorrow um, is really understanding what that risk assessment looks like and how frequently assessing um, and sampling should be done. Um, there's information in there about um, factors promoting pseudomonas growth and biofilm, such as flexible hoses, your straining, uh, your stagnant water, poor temperature, um, development of a drain cleaning program, um, and then putting um, avoidance of putting your hands under the first flush of water was also one of the recommendations that they had within this guidance. Additionally, they had some guidance for new buildings or renovated areas um, and some considerations that should be had around room design. Um, so one thing being only put sinks if you need them, right? And so um, they, you have to recognize that we want sinks available for individuals to be able to clean their hands appropriately and having a water source um, to do that or a water source for, for some other um, need, but not to put extra water sources in a location. Um, choose a sink design that has the splash away from the drain. Um, and if splashing is unavoidable, making sure that the patient's bed and other medical equipment is outside of the area um, of splash. And then prior to opening the renovated or new building location, making sure that there is a very thorough commissioning procedure that is that is. Um, done within that facility. Um, again, um, within all these articles, we are posting them. So these guidelines um, are, are very much summarized here, um, but it is very interesting to see um, uh, what some of the recommendations are around these strategies for prevention of pseudomonas. Thank you, Julia. Uh, <clears throat> and then we can move on um, to the non-fecal coliforms. Um, so you'll notice that the three of these uh, listed here are all in bold. Um, so Enterobacter, Klebsiella, and Serratia. Um, these are routinely going to be on panels to test. Um, it's just part of, you know, general testing that is done in healthcare facility water. Um, so um, these these are routinely tested for. Um, and then Julia is going to share a case on Klebsiella. So the previous um, review, the previous articles we've discussed have really been reviews for um, prevention strategies uh, to prevent those opportunistic infections from occurring in the healthcare setting. Unfortunately, this is a scenario out of a facility um, in um, 
the United Kingdom, um, and they had a uh, hospital um, uh, outbreak of CRE. And what they found was the hospital wastewater sites um, were increasingly being highlighted as important potential reservoirs. And in their facility, they investigated a large Klebsiella pneumonia that was a, actually a KPC producing E. coli outbreak um, with wider CRE incidence trends at this facility over an eight year time frame. Um, and ultimately, um, they went through a number of control interventions, including um, cohorting in patients, following international and national guidelines, rectal screening, environmental sampling, enhanced cleaning, and they ultimately ended up having to go with ward closure um, for two of their wards, um, as well as plumbing replacement um, because of the um, the impact from, from this, this outbreak. And as you can imagine, um, this was not a, uh, a, a, a an easy uh, outbreak to control, right? Closing down this unit was, um, they had to close down um, what appears to be a cardiac ward. Um, and the CRE incidence did decline after that, but it had other implications, right? Your, C your, your cardiac ward is impacted and it had a very high price tag. Um, it would cost um, millions of dollars for them to um, overhaul their 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 plumbing um, that was uh, potentially implicated in this particular um, outbreak. So um, I would not have liked to have been the infection preventionist involved in that facility, um, but it just highlights the fact that um, there are. Um, risk associated with our water and outbreaks that can um, be caused by that. And I did think it was quite interesting that in this scenario, it was a um, KPC producing, which is a whole nother level of challenge. I will note that not all the patients were infected in these in this outbreak. Um, uh, many of them were just um, were, were colonized. Um, however, um, it, it does sound um, like it took quite a bit to get this outbreak under control. Thanks, Julia. Um, and now we can move on to our non-tuberculosis mycobacteria or NTMs as they're more commonly referred to. Um, <clears throat> so there are many different types of testing that can be done for NTMs. Um, and it's important for you to get in touch with your environmental hygienist, um, whoever does your um, water sampling, to determine which tests are available for you and what you might need. Uh, sometimes people will do like a, uh, a, like a routine or a level of testing for NTMs, um, and then a couple of specific NTMs. Um, and then kind of base that off of if those are positive, um, then they can assume it may not be one of the others, or if the you know two specifics are negative, then it's probably one of the others. Um, so kind of looking at the total level of NTM, but again, it's really just important uh, for you to talk to your uh, environmental hygienist to determine uh, which testing is available and you need. Um, and then Julia is going to share a couple of cases of um, NTMs with us. So this was an outbreak review that was done um, out of a facility that had a two-phase uh, mycobacterium abscessus um, outbreak um, that was identified over a period of time. Um, and so phase one of this particular outbreak, um, they had a number of uh, patients that were their high-risk patients, so heart, lung transplant patients, um, cancer patients, some of their surgery patients that had developed um, uh, mycobacterium obsessions, either colonization of their respiratory tract or infections. And their incidence of overall infections with this particular pathogen had increased substantially from um, the previous from the period that they had uh, previously reviewed. And what they found was that their municipal water um, was colonized with mycobacterium obsessions. And that is not, um, again, we've talked about our municipal water is not, um, is not sterile. Um, and so um, they found this in their tap water at their facility. They found it in the tap water in the community. Um, and so they had to do a shift of um, utilization of sterile water for high risk patients. Um, and they actually did this sterile water process um, for any kind of ingestion, wound cleaning, those kinds of things um, that, that 
uh, individuals did if they were a heart or lung transplant in their post-op period, even after they have been discharged. So in their early post-op period, when they went home, um, they also utilized that sterile water process because of the, the level of the mycobacterium obsessives within their, within their municipal water. In uh, around the same time as that, um, they found that they were having an increase in cardiac surgery patients that were positive for mycobacterium obsessives as well. Um, and um, they found that the heating cooler units that were being utilized within the facility, that they were using um, tap water um, for those heater cooler units, um, even though there was a bit of a shift in the recommendation for um, the MIFU in, for the heater cooler units, meaning that they needed to be filtered. Um, they were um, using general tap water um, for those. They also um, overall found um, a number of very interesting um, uh, opportunities that they implemented across their facility. And Kirsten, if you go to the next slide there. So a couple of interventions that they made at their facility, and then they created recommendations that they would suggest that people look at at their own locations. So for example, like I said, they utilized sterile water for direct patient care activities and those individuals that they found to be at risk um, for infections. And so really um, their, their recommendation is to, for facilities to really look at um, what areas um, are you using um, tap water um, in those high risk patients and should you shift to utilizing something else um, depending upon what your local epi shows within your water. Um, heater cooler units um, using a sterile water um, use and a disinfection protocol. Um, there was a number of uh, the, even the next um, outbreak that we talk about is associated with heater cooler units. Um, epi and clinical surveillance for non-NTM infections. Um, and so they really looked at um, a recommendation recommended doing a retrospective and prospective um, surveillance for invasive NTM, um, recommending um, consideration for NTM infection when evaluation with um, infection uh, for our cardiac patients, especially uh, if they have an atypical presentation. And you can see there some of their other recommendations. Um, one thing um, that they did find was making sure that you have high um, monitoring of your hot water temperatures and flow times to your water outlets. And so, like Kirsten said at the beginning, many of us have buildings that are more than one or two stories. And so making sure that your flow, we have a lot of great things from an environmental protection perspective, right? Um, lead um, certification is incredibly important, um, but just making sure that we are still getting water um, up to those highest levels, that it is still hot by the time that it gets to point of use, um, that there is still disinfection in the water by the time it gets to point of use. Um, they found that many of the, their, their system, their hot water system was on a circulator. And so not a lot of that disinfected water went into that hot water system. And so all of these things are things that we should consider when we're looking at our buildings to make sure that we are not having these same, or if we have these risks, that we have mitigation plans in place. And that's really something, again, that George will talk about tomorrow. But this really highlights the why as to why is that so important? Um, it, it's to really recognize that this is the, these outbreaks are what can occur in those scenarios. The next slide um, is an outbreak of mycobacterium chimera that was associated with heater cooling devices. Um, and this was, um, like I said earlier, um, this outbreak with heater cooling devices was, was a global outbreak. Um, and um, what they found was um, that, like I said, it has affected uh, patients in, in, several, in several countries across multiple continents. Um, the clinical infections were characterized by delayed diagnosis or inadequate treatment response to antimicrobial agents, and they actually and had a very poor prognosis. Um, they the investigators found. Uh, the mycobacterium chimera and heater cooler devices in that water circuit. Um, and unfortunately, it was also in the air samples while the heater cooler devices um, were running, which suggested the transmission from the devices to the surgical site 
um, actually could occur via the airborne route. Um, so they found that new heater cooler devices at the manufacturing site were also contaminated with Mycobacterium chimera um, and um, whole genome uh, uh, sequencing data suggested a point source. So um, this outbreak, because of this, um, the recommendation was made that the heater cooler devices um, be uh, uh, located in a location that was separate from the surgical theater um, so that you could decrease the risk of um, contaminating the surgical site with those aerosols. Um, as you can imagine, this was not an easy um, outbreak to contain. Um, the um, challenge being that you can't just not use a heater cooler device for bypass surgeries. Um, and there wasn't really another option readily available that individuals could use in place of these devices that were potentially contaminated. So culturing of the device, culturing of the air, mitigation strategies such as putting the devices in locations that were outside of that operative space, and then um, really understanding patient management until the outbreak could be controlled were very imperative um, to this particular, to, to alleviating this particular outbreak. But it really absolutely shows, you know, in this scenario, the um, manufacturer's instructions for use, how imperative it is that as healthcare facilities that we follow those MIFUs um, to alleviate or prevent the risk of um, contamination of medical devices with pathogens such as your non-tuberculin mycobacterium um, uh, species. Thank you, Julia. <clears throat> um, and so the last um, kind of group that we'll talk about for opportunistic pathogens um, is fungi. And so many of you on this call are probably, you know, thinking, well, I, I don't normally see aspergillus in the water. Um, we don't normally test for that. Um, but this is something that came out of CMS requirements. And um, we'll talk a little bit about CMS um, conditions of participation um, and the expectations of CMS. Um, but Fungi, fungi can live in water. Um, it's more likely that they're going to be found, you know, in a setting, in a situation where there's a water leak and then aspergillus or some other type of um, fun, fungi grows. Um, but due to the CMS requirements, there is testing available for uh, fungi and water sources. Um, and so you can see that this is, you know, a, a short list, um, but there is culturing that can be done um, for all of those. And then, of course, as we know, CRS is a big concern these days. Um, so that is also a use that can be can be looked at as well. Um, and then Julia will share a case on aspergillus. Um, so, so in this particular um, outbreak, um, like Kirsten said, um, many times you don't necessarily associate aspergillus as growing in the water, though um, aspergillus likes water, um, so it can absolutely contaminate your water and there have been outbreaks associated with that. Um, however, in this particular um, situation, there was a routine respiratory sample surveillance that were done among COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit, and they found that three of the patients were identified in a newly opened general intensive care unit during the second wave, second wave of the pandemic to have been um, uh, have, uh, aspergillus. Um, there were no um, obvious cases of aspergillus that they had recognized um, since the unit had opened, and so this was this was relatively new for them. Um, they looked at possible sources, so they looked in the environmental things such as your air handling units. Um, they looked at clinical practice, and ultimately they found um, that there was a leak above the um, nurses' station that um, had resolved. Um, or I, I, they had thought that it has resolved. Um, and so it was not investigated any further. And unfortunately, the leak did not resolve. Um, it was continuing to have a slow leak. Um, and then there was aspergillus or fungal growth in that drywall and other um, components above the ceiling. And so um, th this is what they felt like was the potential cause for um, the uh, outbreak 
of uh, aspergillus or the colonization of aspergillus among the among the patients within that particular unit. And so really understanding that if there is a leak, um, aspergillus, uh, fusarium, our molds really like to grow in um, warm, moist, and um, dark spaces. Um, so, and drywall is a beautiful environment um, for them, uh, those pathogens to grow. And so while um, they may not um, be associated with water um, in such a capacity as maybe your NTMs, they absolutely are associated with things such as stagnant water or uh, water leaks where um, that water source still exists and they have a great environment for them to flourish um, and have nutrition for them, for them to continue to, to grow. Thank you, Julia. All right, so if your IV brain is like mine, I've heard a lot about why I need a water management plan. Um, and all of these real life examples really just, you know, cemented in for me that we need to know why and we need to know how to make or develop one. Um, so let's get into what is a water ma management plan. So this is a plan to identify, mitigate, and prevent those waterborne pathogens in a healthcare setting. This is a requirement um, per CMS, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. Um, and then safety is determined by the water quality as it enters the facility carefully designed plumbing systems, and then efforts to minimize infection risks from water sources. And so, so what do those um, CMS conditions of participation look like? Um, so they sound different for, um, for each, you know, hospital, skilled nursing facility, critical access hospital, but they're generally saying the same thing. Um, so for, for hospitals with condition of participation 482.42, the hospital must have a, provide a sanitary environment to avoid sources and transmission of infections and communicable diseases. There must be an active program for the prevention, control, and investigation of infections and communicable diseases. And then for um, 483.80 for skilled nursing facilities and other nursing facilities, the facility must establish and maintain an infection prevention and control program designed to provide a safe and sanitary and comfortable environment and to help prevent the development and transmission of communicable diseases and infections. And then for critical access hospitals, this would be 485.635. Um, critical access hospital policies must include a system for identifying, reporting, investigating, and controlling infections and communicable diseases of patients and personnel. Uh, and so CMS really expects um, that Medicare certified healthcare facilities um, have, a water, have water management policies and procedures in place to reduce the risk of growth and spread of Legionella and other opportunistic pathogens in the building system. Um, and so conduct, you must, the facilities must conduct a facility risk assessment to identify where Legionella and other opportunistic waterborne pathogens, um, so Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, um, all of the ones that we discussed in our uh, previous slides, um, <clears throat> to identify where those could grow and spread in the facility water system, um, and then implement a water management program that considers the ASHRAE industry standard and the CDC toolkit. Um, and includes control measures uh, such as the physical controls, temperature management, the disinfectant level controls, visual inspections, environmental testing for pathogens, um, and then specify the testing protocols and acceptable ranges for those control measures. Um, and then document the results of the testing and any corrective actions taken when those control limits are not maintained. Um, so we mentioned the ASHRAE um, in the previous slide. So um, this is the American Society of Heating and Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers. Um, so this standard 188-2021 uh, um, is regarding Legionella, Legionellosis of risk management for building water systems. Um, and we just mentioned this in the CMX, CMS expectations. So the minimum requirements look at the design, construction, commissioning, operation, maintenance, repair, replacement, and expansion. Um, so these requirements really go um, from, you know, the whole spectrum it can go from an old building um, or a, an older building that needs updates, needs renovation. This can, this also applies to new buildings that are being newly designed and built. Um, 
then this, this regulation also um, looks at compliance um, and that it has to be readily available. Um, and then has there is a normative appendix um, for healthcare facilities. Um, and this includes the designated team, water system flow diagram, risk management plan, existing building, new construction and renovations, um, and then building water system procedures. And as I said, um, this really covers from design to expansion, from new to existing buildings, um, and then of course the um, potable and non-potable water systems. Um, and then George will get more into using all of these regulations and guidelines, um, as well as the CDC toolkit um, tomorrow. Um, so at this point, we will open it up for questions um, and make sure to join us again for part two tomorrow from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, where George Young will go over the how to develop a water management plan. Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this slide has the information needed for those who want to claim CE credit. Um, Anyone that has a question, please put it in the Q&A or you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can ask the question. Um, ladies, one question that we had was about uh, other places that might require a water management plan. So places like a dental office or an eye doctor, um, those are certainly part of healthcare, but not ones we often think about. Uh, are those, are the, do you know if there are requirements for, for water management plans in those locations? I, the CDC recommends that you have a water management plan in patient in areas where you're going to provide um, some level of patient care. Um, now, whether or not there's, you know, CMS requirements are, are different. So the, C, the CDC does have recommendations for water management um, across multiple um, levels of care. Um, but generally, for sure, like as it relates to CMS, obviously it's our long-term care locations, um, uh, long-term acute care, hospitals, those CMS requirements are those places that are getting CMS dollars. Um, but generally speaking, the yes, you should have a water um, management plan, really places that, that have water. Thank you. And we do have another question. Uh, someone is asking whether there will be, we will provide a copy of the slides that we are using today and tomorrow. Yes, the slides, um, we'll have a copy of the slides located um, on our on our website um, after tomorrow's, um, after we complete tomorrow's presentation. It'll probably take a couple of days for us to get them uploaded, but they will be available on the site. Thank you. I'm checking to see if we have, I don't see any other questions um, at this time. So again, I'd like to thank you all for participating today and joining us. And um, again, visit our website for further information about the uh, programs and what we offer. And uh, have a great day and hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow at noon. Thank you.